Okay, welcome back. We're going to continue our study of vector spaces on our path to learning what is a tensor. This box will represent a vector space. We'll name it V, and I won't bother to say that it has an addition property and a uh, scalar multiplication property, but to identify it as a real vector space, I'll throw down the, the real numbers right there, and I'll write up in here its dimensionality, which is 4. Now, we talked about yesterday that a four-dimensional vector space always has four vectors, or there can, we can always find four vectors um, that will, uh, uh, through linear combinations of these four vectors, these four vectors combine uh, linearly through the real numbers using the uh, multiplication property of scalars and the vector addition property, can produce any other vector in the vector space. So if there's a vector in the vector space called M, we can always write it as a real number times W with the vector addition property of a real number times V with the vector addition property of the real number times P plus a vector addition property of the real number times Q, where W, V, P, and Q are vectors that are elements of the vector space, and A, B, C, and D are real numbers drawn from the bucket of scalars, which in this case are real scalars. And of course, this is a real vector space. So now what I want to do is a very big notational step. I want to take these four basis vectors, which are not unique. We already discussed that all we know is that the minimum number of, of vectors you need to produce an arbitrary M, any M that's in this vector space, can always be produced for a four-dimensional vector space through the linear combination of four basis vectors. It could be fewer. Right? M, could, M could actually be, say, AW, in which case it would only need one. But to pick, but that would be a special M, right? To pick any M, an arbitrary M, you need all four. So what we're now going to do is we're going to say, let's assume a basis exists. Let's pick, identify one particular basis of this set. That's an arbitrary choice because there's an infinite number of possibilities um, for, for basis vectors but we're going to have to pick one because we kind of want to work with the vector space. And working with the vector space almost always means picking a basis. That's not always true. You can do this theory in a basis-free way, but we'll talk about that later. But right now, we're going to pick a basis. And when we pick a basis, what we do is we call every member of the basis E for our notation. And E is going to represent all four of these vectors, but to distinguish each one, we're going to give it a subscript. So E0 will represent the first basis vector, E1 will represent the second, E2 will represent the third, and E3 will represent the fourth. And if we want to talk about the basis in general, we will talk about E sub mu. The Greek letters will go from 0, 1, 2, 3. We always start counting at zero um, in the modern system. Uh, there, are, there are texts and books out there that start at one and go to four. We don't do that. We start at zero, like a good computer scientist would do. So this is now, this is now our sort of representation of a basis. And we know that we can create any vector in the vector space V by using a linear combination of these four vectors. And the big step we took is we made the notation such that the subscript of the basis vectors is on the bottom, right? We have a subscript. I'm sorry, all subscripts are on the bottom, but we don't have a superscript, right? This is a subscript. This is huge. When we do this, this simple choice is, gonna, um, is going to um, percolate through our entire discussion of general relativity and entire discussion of tensors. So now the next notational step we take is we say, take an arbitrary vector A, right? A comes out of the vector space. It's an arbitrary vector. And I'm normally, you know, to distinguish it as a vector, sometimes they're boldface in text, like that maybe. Um, sometimes they might have a vector symbol over the top. I kind of want to avoid the little arrow because I'm trying to get you to not think of vectors as arrows. But these are members of the vector space V. And in every case, we can break this down into the R4 basis vectors, right? That's, perhaps that's the definition of a basis vector. So we know that it's going to be um, A times E0 plus B times E1 plus C times E2 
plus d times e3, where, um, where now I'm asserting that a, b, c, and d are the linear combinations of these vectors appropriate to build a. But the next notational step is to do the obvious thing. Let's call these, these things are called, the these are real numbers, right? These are real numbers drawn from the real, the real scalars that are associated with the vector space. And these are vectors that actually live in the vector space. So these real numbers, we can simplify them as well. We don't need to constantly have a new symbol for each real number. So what we do is we just say, oh, we're going to call this A0. We're going to call this component A1. We're going to call this component A2. And we're going to call this component A3. Right? And so, and our shorthand sum using the Einstein summation convention will be A mu E mu. Now, what we've done is we've just re just decided that, hey, the, the component of the vector A in the basis E, well, the zero component is going to always be written with the same symbol as the vector with a superscript, right? And we choose a superscript for the components. And you could ask why. Well, why do we choose a superscript? Why not just have a subscript down here, right? What's, what's to stop us from writing, writing A mu E mu. And the answer is there's nothing. There's nothing to stop us from choosing this convention. However, we're going to discover why soon this is the pre preferred convention. Linear algebra textbooks always use this convention when they discuss matrix notation and matrix multiplication and they use symbols for that. But we are not going to do that. We're not going to use this convention. This is the, this is the key convention, the Einstein summation convention. And the key point here is that we've identified a basis, which is a vector in the vector space, and we've identified the components of this vector, and that comes from the real numbers, right? Okay, so that is a huge notational step that's going to live with us forever, and we'll explain why we do the um, up index and down index, but just understand we sum over these, so this expression is exactly equal to that expression. Okay, so now... Once we know this notation, we're going to talk about a very, very important concept now. And this is the concept of mapping. And I'll just call it maps. The idea of a map is very straightforward. We create a vector space, and I'm, you're going to see me do this kind of thing a lot, a four-dimensional vector space over the real numbers. And we create another vector space, right? And it doesn't have to have the same number of dimensions. I'll call it W. And let's just say this one has 10 dimensions, right? But we're going to make it real. We're going to make it two real vector spaces. So we have two vector spaces now. And in this vector space, I identify a basis, and I'll call it E mu. And in this vector space, I identify a basis. I'll call that basis F mu. I could actually call this, I could actually call the basis here E mu as well, but I have to distinguish uh, the fact that these E's belong to W and these E's belong to V. So some books would literally use like a boldface V here and a boldface W here. But these are the basis vectors of mu U. These are the basis vectors of W. So now the question is, is can I create a relationship between these two vector spaces? And I could, in principle, create a map, and I'll call that map lambda. And lambda's goal is to take any vector that lives in this vector space and assign it to a vector that lives in that vector space, very much like a function. In fact, there are some maps that are, in fact, functions. But we're just going to call it a map for now. And it's got to take any vector has got to have a home over here. We're not going to be too picky, but uh, we need to know that each vector here has a home over there. Yeah, each vector in V has a home in W. And this map is a very specific thing. It's a rule. It's a rule that tells you, given this vector as an input, it will give you one of these as an output. And the way we kind of write that mathematically is something like this. This is a map that from the domain of V to the range W. And then we write the map acting on a specific vector. Let's pick a vector from V. Let's call it um, V, little v, right? A specific map acting on V gives you, say, W. Or you could write a specific map acting on V as in a function form gives you W. Right? This is this form here is sort of a of an operator form. This operates on this and gives you this. This is more of a function form. This thing is a function. You stick in an argument and it gives you that. 
But the actual notation we're going to use that's most useful here is this thing called the bracket notation, where the map goes in the first slot, and then there's a comma, and then the object or the uh, um, domain vector goes into the right slot, and the answer is a vector from W. This is, this is um, a very common notation in this theory of vector spaces, and it's somewhere between these two. Uh, you know, if you wrote it down like this, with an empty slot on the right, it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like a function, right? It's waiting for something to be put here, and then it'll give you W. Um, there's something very nice about this notation as well uh, that we'll learn about later, but this is the notation we're going to use. This is a map acting on this vector, gives you um, a W. And you, and these maps can be arbitrary, right? We can we just have to figure out a way to create these rules that, given a V, produce a W. So how do we do that? How do we create a rule that will teach you that will give you um, uh, that will give you all of these? Let me just move this aside. That will uh, will actually give you these maps, or, or will will manifest themselves as as maps. So let's let's learn how to do that. So the rule basically is very straightforward. If I can tell you how the map acts on each basis vector, right? If I know how the map acts, I like this. Um, you'll see that I, 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 I like this operator notation, and I fall into it, even though I said that we weren't going to do it, right? I just immediately fell right into it. If I can give you these, this is not a subscript. This is a comma, right? You'll notice this bracket notation is very similar to what you see in quantum mechanics, but it's not the same thing. It is different. Do not think that this is the same thing as what you might have seen in uh, quantum mechanics. So now, um, so if I can tell you what these four maps are, if I can specifically assign that map of lambda on the first basis vector gives you something, and the map of lambda on the second basis vector gives you something. This will tell me how the map works on every vector in the vector space. And the reason is is because these are linear maps, and I'll show you in a moment. But I can pick this arbitrarily, right? I can now do whatever I want. I can say, oh, this is uh, 3F1 plus 2F4 plus F10. I can say this is uh, pi times F, which one haven't I used? 3 plus uh, um, e to the 17th power of f0. And I can say that this one, oh, this one just equals f2. Let's, that one's very simple, say. And then this one, you know, whatever whim or fancy I have for the last one, let's take the uh, prime, the odd ones, f3 plus f5 plus f7 plus f9, right? This is completely whimsical choice, right? I can choose anything I want. But once I know those, I can lean on the fact that the maps we're interested in are linear, right? We're only interested in linear maps. Uh, God, that looks horrible. Linear, which means this, which means a map acting on the sum of two vectors. Now, uh, whoops, I better better not use W since I've already used W before. Say vector V and vector P, both of them in the domain, right? These two vectors here are in the domain V. They can't, that's, this, that equals the sum of the map applied to V and the map applied to P. Now understand how this sum works, right? Lambda is the map. V and P are in the domain vector space. So this addition is from this vector space's addition property. This result is a member of the domain W. So this result is a member of domain W. So this addition is actually the W's addition property. So here I'm adding two vectors in W after I've mapped, after I've mapped V and P individually, I add the vectors in W, but that's the same as adding the vectors in V and then mapping the result. That's what linear means. Well, that's part of what linear means. The other part is that if I had a constant in front of uh, 
uh, V, say, then that constant would end up out here. If I had a constant in front of B, that constant would end up out here. And that's just now, now that becomes the real number from the real vector space uh, for uh, the real number or the scalar multiplication property in W, the scalar multiplication property in W. So here I use the scalar multiplication property in V, the scalar multiplication property in V, then I add the two vectors using the addition property in V. I can do everything in W and execute the map to get two vectors in W, do the scalar multiplication property in W, and then uh, add them together. So that is how maps are defined. And, um, we are, we, and once you create this map, you can create it arbitrarily, but that you define it based on its ve vectors, vector, um, based on the basis. Once you create a map for the basis, you can map anything. And the reason you can do that is because, I will now uh, shrink this up. Um, whoops. The reason you can do that, of course, is because an arbitrary vector from V, remember here's our two vector spaces, an arbitrary vector from B we call A, and that equals A mu E mu. So the map we're calling lambda. So lambda acting on A equals, oops, lambda acting on A equals lambda acting on A mu E mu. But of course, this is just that sum, A0 E0 plus A1 E1 plus A2 E2 plus A3 E3. And that sum is, we just break that apart and we get A0 lambda E0 plus A1 lambda E1 plus the other two, right? Plus the same process for these two. And of course, we know how this, we know how these maps work because that's what we defined, right? When we when we looked at when we looked at this, right, we defined we defined these things right here, right? This is what we defined. We know lambda e zero. We know lambda e one. We know lambda e two and e three. We know this, right? We know this. We know the other four. And once we know those, we just multiply and we get our answer. So now we know how to map any vector. So that's a big step. Now we understand mappings for any single vector. So the next lecture is going to be on the, once we know this, now we can define what's called the dual space and that's our next lecture.